fast travel is one of those ultra basic bedrock tools of game design. Some games almost demand to have some kind of fast travel system, but the devil is in the details. It's like a wrench. The same wrench can fix a loose connection or be thrown into a running engine and do a lot of damage. How a game implements its fast travel is the difference between solving a problem, ignoring it, or creating a whole new one. Let's talk about the different shapes a fast travel system can take and how you can craft one that fits just right. But first, fast travel to the end of your project with Milnote. Do you have a project in your head right now? Let's get it out of there and free up some space. Milnote is a powerful tool to help get your personal and group projects organized. Mike and I have been using it to plan episodes for a couple of years now. It's the fastest way I've found to get text notes, images, links, and files grouped together to get your whole team working towards the same vision. There are built-in templates for lots of project types, including game design. No matter the structure of your game, Milnote lets your team stay creative and hold all your game-making plans in one place. Storyboards and mood boards, to-dos, notes, and inspiration. Did you see something that sparked an idea that you want others to see? Drop it in. Have a plan to change a level? Draw your ideas right on the picture and get feedback right away. It has a modern, easy-to-use interface that everyone can pick up. Whether you're a project manager, artist, designer, or programmer, and no matter the size of your team. Milnote's intuitive drag-and-drop interface and built-in templates are made to help everyone be the best they can be. Best of all, Milnote is free to sign up. Click the link in the description and let Milnote help take your projects from a dream to a plan. Thanks, Milnote. What's the point of fast travel? Yeah, haha, it's traveling fast, duh, but why do we need it? We're not fighting against reality here. You can't teleport yourself from New York to Paris, but a game can take you from Kayla to Lendell in two seconds, no problem. Games are a world created, unbound by reality. All parts of them, including travel, could be anything you want them to be. They could take any structure. Think about a point-and-click adventure game, like Ace Attorney where you're just teleporting from point to point whenever you move around. In that game, there's no need for fast travel. All travel is fast travel. The only time that fast travel can be a thing at all is when moving around comes with some cost of time and space. Fast travel is a tool to cut down that cost. But what is it exactly that we're cutting out? And why was that cost put in the game to begin with? Fast travel isn't one single thing. If you're putting in a fast travel system, you've got a lot of options. Let's start with something basic, like teleporting. There are roughly 25 trillion games that let you jump from wherever you are to a number of set points of interest on the map. Maybe it's the front door of a big city, or the safe point in a church just after a boss you fought 10 hours ago. In most games, fast travel is pretty close to teleportation. It could just be literally that. One second you're on a beach, and the next, you've loaded into the broken reality zone. Fast travel that lets you instantly jump to points of interest is super convenient. Skyrim is your classic example. There are hundreds of points of interest that you can teleport to if you've already been there. Just go outside, bring up the map, and pick your spot. The points of interest are so frequent and densely packed together that you're rarely more than a minute away from any point on the map. Other games like Breath of the Wild and Elden Ring are a little more reserved with their teleportation points. In those two, fast travel is tied to just the more important areas, like Sheikah Towers and Shrines, or Sites of Grace. They work the same as Skyrim though, just open the menu and zip around. Being able to jump around the map is a major factor that lets these open world games maintain their go anywhere, do anything philosophy. Whenever you get bored or hit a wall, jump out there and find something new to do. Teleporting from point to point can even be a technical convenience. Did you get stuck on level geometry? Instead of softlocking, now you can just teleport away. Teleporting can also be a godsend for completionists. If a player has already checked off large chunks of what used to be there to do, teleportation can let you skip over a long, eventless stretch of walking, and helps keep the late game from feeling like it's wasting your time. Teleportation-style fast travel is so common nowadays that it's easy to overlook, but don't forget that it became common for a reason. It's really handy. A little less common are games where you can only go between fast travel hubs. These will teleport you around the same as the last ones, but you have to get to a hub to be able to travel to another one. The diegetics of this style are usually stronger, 
Instead of just going to a menu and fading out to a loading screen, this might be shown as a city bus network, or save points you have to get to to make the fast travel work. Hub to Hub is less of a get out of jail free card than the Anywhere to Hub model. You have to do a little work to get to where you want to be. Games that go hub to hub have to worry more about where all the hubs are placed. How many of them are you going to have? Too many and you risk undercutting the beautiful world your game should be exploring. The best open world games usually pride themselves on the things that happen in between the things you're going to. The serendipity of not really knowing what you're about to find on the other side of that hill. You're supposed to get distracted by the things you find along the way in these worlds. If you're just zipping around to the places you know about, you're not going to spot a random Korok seed, or a mini dungeon, or a falling star, or a surprise boss. This world isn't meant to be 20 boss fights strung together. It's meant for you to leave the beaten path, not skip over it. Put down too many hubs and players might spend less time looking at vistas and more time looking at menus. But too few hubs or too many in the wrong place can be a problem too. Final Fantasy XIV's Aetherite network is a crystal-themed, teleporty-styled system with a fee based on the distance traveled. Nearly every zone in the game has one to three of the crystals to use, of wildly varying placement quality. Some of the older zones featured in the 2013 relaunch had Aetherite crystals placed way out of the way from common quest areas and objectives. Your reward for paying in-game currency to fast travel was the slow travel through some more uneventful terrain. The most infamous crystal problem shows up in the main story quest. There's a primary base of operations you visit all the time, called the Waking Sands, sitting within Vesper Bay, a small port village. Vesper Bay is not surrounded by an Aetherite. The closest one is to the east, in another small town called Horizon. Just about everyone had to teleport to Horizon, then take a minute-long trek to Vesper Bay. Not once, either. You kept coming back several times during major quest lines. The travel time added up in a hurry. There are some light story reasons for why it's designed the way it is, but come on, would it kill you to bring that crystal a little closer? Now all you secret superfans know the real way of getting to Vesper Bay. You go to another city and take a secret ferry. Shh, don't tell the new players. They're never gonna figure that one out. <laughs> oh, wasting time. The trip to Vesper Bay was such a common complaint that it became a meme in the FF14 community. By update 5.3, the developers finally started giving out a consumable item called the Vesper Bay Aetherite Ticket, which sent you to where you wanted to go directly. I, of course, didn't realize the tickets were a thing until after I finished A Realm Reborn story. That one's on me. At least The Waking Sands doesn't matter after you get passed in the story. Square has fixed the bigger problem, at least. The recent expansions of 14 have been more careful about story quest locations and Aetherite placement. The same principle applies in mass transit in real life as in video games. Cluster your hubs where people want to go. There's one thing I don't like about teleporting though. It's a little too divorced from the game world. It's not the worst thing you could do, but there's something about it that breaks immersion a little bit for me. You do have other options though. What if you thought about faster travel from a level design angle? I'm talking about shortcuts. It's super common in action-adventure games to design a level's layout with shortcuts in mind. If you've just been the boss at the top of a dungeon, it'd be annoying to backtrack through the whole thing to get out. Some games cut to black or just warp you to the front. Dark Souls usually gives you something like a ladder to kick down or an elevator to activate that lets you speed your way to the entrance again. Plenty of Zelda games have unlockable doors and other shortcuts that let you get around more quickly as you progress. They could get creative with them too. In Ocarina of Time, you can plant magic beans in some overworld areas as Child Link, then warp to the future, where those beans have grown into magic plants that can give you access to more areas as Adult Link. Metroidvanias often build their character progression around blocking you from taking the shortcut somewhere until you've gone far enough to unlock specialized moves. As you unlock things like a high jump, a speed boost, or a morph ball, you're gradually opening up the world and streamlining your travel. There are some parts of Metroid Prime where later abilities let you just skip over level design components. Once you find the space jump, you can hop over this morph ball segment that you used to have to track through. The power to make shortcuts doesn't have to come from within you though. Maybe you just pay a guy. Spelunky is a roguelike with a set series of levels to go through in order, but you can skip a lot of the easier ones if you've talked to the Tunnel Man. You'll find him at the end of an area, where he'll ask you for items, pay the man a few times, 
and he'll create a tunnel that works as an instant warp from the start to the deeper parts of the cave. You only have a few options for where you can take the tunnels. There are only a few hubs in this case, but you will pass through them on every run. Skipping levels isn't as much of a problem in this roguelike as it would be in, say, Hades, where you're slowly building your character's skills over a run. Your character progression in Spelunky is what items you carry. There are no health upgrades or secret skills other than what the things you find will give you. You can take on the final boss from the start of the game, if you manage to get to the end, and using the tunnels can make it much easier to get there in one piece. In this context, level skips are fast travel. It doesn't look like fast travel in a game like Skyrim, but Spelunky's tunnels cover the same function in a different form. So we've got teleporting, we've got shortcuts, how else can we get around the world quickly? Well, we could just go straight to the source here. What if you focus on character movement? Just make that way faster. Go ride a bike, get on a horse, steal an airship. Do whatever movement you were doing before, but at like three times the speed. Now, this one isn't as fast as teleporting to where you want to go, but speeding up your natural movement gets you the added bonus of control. You have full reign over where you want to go and how you get there. You can spot things along the way and stop for detours, just like with your base movement. In the best case scenario, if your movement is fun enough and fast enough, you can even make teleporting fast travel feel unnecessary. It's good to keep around as a fallback, but you can make players prefer to get to where they're going on their own. This is, I think, the best part of Insomniac Spider-Man games. Moving around as Spidey is not only fast, but extremely satisfying too. You transition from free-falling, to swinging, to wall-running, to vaulting seamlessly. But there's depth to your movement kit that lets you get around even faster, and you can tinker and practice with getting the most out of it on the way to your next objective. The way you move in the game feels great, but the density of things to do helps as well. You always have something just around the corner, be it collectibles or spontaneous side missions that you can jump right into if they catch your eye. The game supports the intrinsic satisfaction of swinging around with plenty of extrinsic reasons to go from place to place without teleporting there. It's honestly easy to forget that the teleport is even an option. Personally, the only time I think about it is when I have to get to the complete opposite side of the map. Otherwise, I'm gonna take a little more time. The range of fast travel options in Spider-Man are still a great quality of life feature for getting to the next story beat immediately or when you're doing cleanup for a completionist run, but the game found a way to make its movement engaging enough for it to not be necessary. Spider-Man's traversal options are very fun to use, but another more subtle reason they work is that they're almost always ready to go. They're very convenient to use. That's not always the case in other games. Breath of the Wild has a teleportation style fast travel system that players use pretty often to zoom around to a tower or shrine in a specific region. But that's not the only method that Nintendo built to get you around this landscape. Horses are here too, and they're around to help you zip through areas in a much more fine-grained way, though they aren't without some major drawbacks. Horses aren't free, you gotta get one yourself. Find one in the wild, sneak up to it, mount it, and tame it. Once you've got a new friend, go to the horse DMV and get all your paperwork in order. Name it at one of the many stables across Hyrule. You can park multiple horses at the horse garage and call them out as needed to go riding off into adventure together. Is what I want to say, but horses in this game come with a lot of inconveniences that make them very situational. On smooth, open terrain, horses are great. On rough terrain, don't even bother. Your horse will e-brake and refuse to go forward. They can't cross rivers, mountains, or deserts, which is fine because there aren't any of those anywhere. You can hop off and go up the cliff yourself, but in this game, horses aren't magic. They're horses. You won't be able to call it back by your side to continue on, because it'll either be too far away, or it can't find a path to get to you. If you find another stable, an NPC can magic the horse back to you, but you'll have to get to one on foot, or by shrine. Either way, it's just inconvenient enough to make it a hassle to bother with the horse in the first place. What most often happens is that you'll take a horse for a minute or two ride towards something interesting, get blocked by terrain, dismount to explore on foot, and forget about your horse entirely. The game's DLC added some special equipment that you can find to fix the issue. It's magic. It's straight up magic. Teleport your horse to wherever you want and go on your merry way. That gear is well out of your way though, and they also added a motorcycle that runs on rougher terrain, completely outclassing every horse. 
Breath of the Wild's efforts to give a realistic underpinning to their fast travel horses do just enough to nerf the option from a convenience to an inconvenience. No matter what form it takes, fast travel dramatically changes how traversing through a game feels. With that much power though, it's easy to undercut the design of a game. We're gonna have to think about some limiters here. All that power should come at a price. How do you give players fast travel options without giving them free reign? Most of the time, games force you to get somewhere the slow way at least once before you can travel there. Visit the Poké Center and you can fly back to it. That sort of thing. If you could get to an endgame zone and skip the content for how you're supposed to get there, you'd be throwing a player into the deep end. You'd send people into areas full of mechanics players don't understand, story beats they haven't heard, power levels they need but don't have, equipment they don't know exists, and a world state that they have no context for. Making players actually reach locations manually at least once can assure that players have the context they need to understand what they've gotten themselves into. You could also limit fast travel by forcing players to pay resources to use it. It could be cash, secret gems, keys you need to gather, anything you have to get from the world through normal play. This gives an extra incentive for players to interact with other systems. Some games tie unlocking fast travel to story progress. For many Final Fantasy games, the airship was the fastest way to get around, and usually didn't unlock until the second half of the game, or even later. At that point, players are fully invested in the story, know the major landmarks of the world, and have several optional plot threads and side quests to work towards at their own pace. It's not all or nothing though. You can use the story to unlock fast travel options more piecemeal than that. Metroidvania structure themselves around this, but it shows up in other genres too. Pokemon Scarlet and Violet gives you a vast region to explore, but you can't move around very well in it. Until you make a new friend. Very early on, you team up with one of the box legendary Pokemon that you can ride as a living bike. It's a mediocre bike, but we can make some upgrades. One of the major quest lines involves going around and hunting for legendary ingredients guarded by gigantic boss Pokemon. Do that, and your weird hair buddy will make a delicious sandwich. Your bike guilt trips you into feeding it the sandwich. It's cool though, because each time that happens, your traversal options expand. With every ingredient you find, you unlock new abilities like sprinting, swimming, high jumps, gliding, or climbing, making reaching different parts of the world much easier. Unlike a Metroidvania, you aren't totally shut out of these areas without these powers, but traversal becomes less of a headache with each new one. It does a good job of balancing exploration with a satisfying sense of progression. Fast travel down to the comments and let's talk about movement and fast travel. Teleporting around is too basic. I want to hear about the weirder systems that you all know about. Fast travel is powerful, sometimes too powerful for a game's own good. Getting the right combination of convenience and power without undermining discovery and shoving people into menus is a tough balancing act to pull off but it can be done. 